do that? Cool, okay. Bear with me while I bring up the PowerPoint. <clears throat> And no, I don't want that. I don't want that. Come on, God, come down. Oh God, it's be, it's bear with me. It's being temperamental actually playing this thing. Play from the start. Okay, here we go. Right, so um, can everybody see that? Uh, give me a thumbs up for somebody if you can, just so I know it's working. Yay, yeah. thank you, Samuel, that's great. Okay guys, so look, um, in an ideal world, of course, we would be meeting together and I do like to make my lectures quite interactive. Um, so let's say that the rules of play for this are keep your audio off unless you want to ask questions or you want to have a chat um, or, or answer some questions that I might ask you. Um, because, you know, it's, it's no fun if you're just hearing me talking at you for 50 minutes. So please do feel free to chip in. Um, okay, so today we are going to discuss Dionysus, looking particularly at the Bacchae. Um, last week was primarily an introduction to the idea of what theatre can do for us. The massive contrast between what theatre meant for the Greeks in terms of a social, political, religious right, and what it means for us, which is, you know, going to Billy Elliot. Um, so, in this lecture, I want us to talk about the god Dionysus, who was the god of tragedy, the god of theatre, the god of wine, women and song, and to try to unpick how an understanding of the um, multiplicity, the, the multiple facets of the god Dionysus can help us contextualise Greek tragedy and also our understanding of the potential for theatre and performance in a contemporary society. However, before we get on to the Greeks, I want to ask you a question. I somewhere, yes, there we go. Okay, starting with this, this quotation that I used last week, which is from Paul, Paul Cartledge, saying that tragedy was an integral part, if you like, of the subconscious of the Greeks. Um, we're going to discuss mimesis. Um, I'll get onto that term in a little bit, so don't worry about that. But think for a moment about this, this idea of the everyday consciousness and the nocturnal dreams. Think about yourselves and the difference between what you are aware of empirically in the day and what you dream about at night. Now, empirical, that's a form of knowledge, and all it means is that it's knowledge based on what you can see and what you think you know. So it's a, it's a type of knowledge that's discussed in philosophy, but for the time being, all you need to know is that empirical knowledge is simply what you think you know through your perceptions. When we get to the nocturnal dreams, of course, the idea of what is a perception and what you think you know can be slightly more uh, nebulous, difficult to define. For instance, I had a great dream last night that I was trying to enforce 1.5 uh, social distancing in a queue for Kentucky Fried Chicken. I haven't had Kentucky Fried Chicken since about 1992, I reckon. So where that came from, God only knows. And it was in the Leicester Forest East service station down the M1 in Britain. Uh, go figure. Where does that come from? So think about that, that, that correlation and also the, um, the disparate pull between what we think we know and what we think we know in our dreams, very, very different. So reality and illusion brush up against each other in our dreams. So um, were I live with you, I would actually be doing this on one of those overhead projectors, which many of you probably won't remember since I'm very, very old. Unable to do that, I have found an image. Somebody tell me what this is. This is where you need to turn off your audio and somebody talk to me. What is this? A shadow puppet? Yeah, yeah, shadow puppet. Any advances on a shadow puppet? Um, a bunny, maybe? Bunny, yes! Thank you so much. It's a bunny. Is it a bunny? What's this then? That's a big hand. Hand. So, is. going back to that, is this a hand or a bunny? How creative do you want to be? Well, I'm not, um, it's not a rhetorical question, so chip on in there. A hand, oh. um, pretending to be a bunny? 
a hand, pretending to be a bunny, okay. And this, are we quite confident that this is a hand? Is the bunny in the corner? Is that a bunny? That's the right. <laughs> oh, yes, I love this image. So we've got a hand and a bunny. Yep. Yeah? Are we happy with that? Yeah, okay, we're very happy, but this is a hand and this is a bunny. Except, of course, it's not a hand, is it? Because it is a representation of a hand. It is a sculpture of a hand, as opposed to a real hand. So what does that make the bunny? Is that a real shadow of a bunny? Or is it a fake shadow of a bunny because the shadow is cast by a hand that is not real, but is fake? Anyone want to chip in on that? Are your brains sufficiently itchy for 10 past 10 in the morning? I've stunned you into silence. Okay, so here we have a bunny, but it's not a bunny, is it? It is the silhouette of a hand creating a bunny, except it's not that either, because it is the silhouette of a hand creating a bunny, which has been represented by the miracle of photography and then turned into pixels to be sent through algorithms to our computers on the internet. And here we have the similar thing, a pixelated algorithmed dots and lines of computer and mathematic coding, which is creating a fake hand, creating a fake bunny in a fake picture, which is actually not a picture, because it is nothing more than pixels and mathematics. And then we have this. So here is a drawn picture, another representation of a representation of a representation. And then we have this, dear old Winston Churchill. Okay, so the reason that I've been so, if you like, fay with all of these bunnies is because I want you to understand or to try to get your heads around the idea that what we think we see is not necessarily what is, or rather what is is not necessarily what we think is, because is can be, if you like, um, twisted and manipulated into any number of alternative realities. So here we have Winston Churchill. Um, somebody give me a rundown of what you think though that hand means. Any takers? The meaning? It's the V victory. V for victory, absolutely. Except the first time Winston Churchill used that image, it was actually this, the other way around, which is fuck off, isn't it? There's Noel Gallagher from Oasis, thanks so much, takes me right back to 1991. All in the context, V for victory and fuck off, I'm in Oasis. So all of these things then are contributing, I hope, to a sense, a growing sense, that what we think we know, the empirical knowledge that we apply to understanding the world, is not necessarily as simple as we think it might be. If you're now thinking, is there any method in this madness? Why aren't we talking about Greek tragedy? Um, I'd like to say to you that this is probably the most relevant, germane and pertinent understanding that we can possibly give to Greek tragedy. In other words, seeming and being what we think we know, what we think we don't know, the multiple realities that we are unable to perceive, and our unconscious, the nocturnal dreams and nightmares which haunt us. So, so far we haven't touched on the Greeks, let's touch on the Greeks. Uh, here we have, actually, well, actually, somebody tell me, what do you think we have in this image? Any takers? Okay. So um, this, mm. Oh, uh, I, I think it's a representation of, um, a, I don't remember which philosopher it was, but the idea of the cave where... Yeah. Um, the people are living in the cave and they only ever see the shadows of the world outside, but they think that's what real things are until yeah. they go out of the cave. Fantastic. That's brilliant. So it is Plato's allegory of the, of the cave from book seven of his Republic. Now, this is an important uh, allegory and also important story in relation to Greek tragedy, because though it was written down a little bit after the golden time of Greek tragedy, it was still in the fifth century. So this is giving us a, a window into the understanding of knowledge and learning and perception that was going on at the same time as the tragedies. So this is the story. Plato says this. I want you to imagine 
that there are a group, there is a group of people, four sods, chained up to the back of a wall. They can't move. They can't move their heads. They can't move their bodies. They've been there for their entire life. They know nothing different. And so one day this bloke comes along and he thinks, oh yeah, this is going to be a laugh. And he has an, uh, a s puppet of uh, a bird and he creates a silhouette from the fire over there onto the wall of the bird. And of course the people who are chained up who know no different think, oh bloody hell, that's a bird, whoa. Think, for this about, think about this for a moment. How do they know it's a bird? How do they know that this image when reflected is like the bunny that we saw, that this is actually a bird? What is the context of their understanding given that they have never seen a bird? that they've spent their entire life chained up in this cave looking at silhouettes. And it gets more and more exciting. They bring on a cart. Uh, these people bring on spears and all sorts of things, all of these props from everyday life in Athens. And these poor sods here see this all reflected through silhouettes, through shadow play on the wall. And they think that that is reality. But one day, one of the people chained up against the wall is thinking, well, heck, I need a chiropractor. So he starts to wriggle out of the chains and he manages to stand up and he looks behind him and he thinks, bloody hell, there's a bloke with a puppet of a bird and the big fire casting shadows. And he tries to tell everybody here, guys, you'll never guess what I can see. And they all say, shut up, we're watching neighbours. Actually, better than that, maths. We're watching maths which I haven't partaken in this year, but I was a total addict last year. So here they are watching crap reality TV, or better still, Gogglebox, which I love. Actually, that's a very good point. They are watching people watching people who aren't people, but again, are digitally created on a screen. Okay, so our guy who is now out of the chains wriggles out and he walks past this fellow, so hello, like your puppet, and he walks all the way up, 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 out into the daylight. And as he sees the sun, he's blinded by the sun and goes, whoa, full on. And it takes him quite a while for his eyes to acclimatize and for him to actually see what is going on in the real world. And he comes back down, he rushes back down and he tells the mates who are still chained up, you'll never guess, there's a whole world out there with the sun and it's amazing. And of course, these guys are thoroughly pissed off with him because he has challenged their idea of reality. He has upended their empirical perception of the world and they don't want to know anything about it. So this story then, how does this story relate to Greek tragedy and to the Bacchae? Well, for that, we need to think about these terms. Mimesis. So mimesis is the Greek word for representation. It, it also has a number of other connotations, such as pretending or acting or characterization in different forms. But representation for us is probably the key. So again, this is where we go back to the shadow of the bunny or the shadow puppet of the bird. Something which is pretending to be something. So for those of you who were um, physically present at the first lecture I gave, think about that urn when I passed around a lecturer's urn and I asked you to think, is this an urn pretending to be an urn, except it was a real urn because it had real ashes in and came from a funeral parlor, but then it stopped being an urn because it was an urn representing an urn on stage, which was also a prop to represent an urn because Orestes wasn't dead levels and levels and levels of perception and of reality and of representation. So this brings us to the key thing and the key theme of the Bacchae, which is seeming and being. How many levels of reality do we see in the cave? And it is, as you unpick it, virtually endless. What is the acted truth of what is the real truth? And is there such a thing as a real truth? Perhaps it's tautological, in other words, real and truth mean the same things. Or perhaps, if you're listening to Donald Trump, it's actually paradoxical, an oxymoron, that real and truth have very little correlation. So, when we look at an actor, whom do we see on stage? Is it a person? Is it a real character? Is it an, a mimetically framed character? 
And is the person playing the character real? Because is the frame of your perception of that person creating an empirical understanding of their realness? Now, if this right now is doing your head in and you're thinking this is too much information, I just want to know about the theatrical practice and the history of Greek tragedy. Don't worry. OK, don't worry. The thing is, you can read up on the history of Greek tragedy anytime you want. But the great thing about a forum like this is that it is helping us to unpick the very ontological roots of tragedy and of performance. I mentioned that word ontological in our very first week, and it means the study of being. So the ontological roots, the very roots of being, being, seeming, reality, fiction, subconscious, conscious. So let us go back to the idea of the theatron, the Greek theatre that we talked about in the very first week. Here we have again the skene on which the three actors performed, the orchestra where the chorus performed, the parados where, uh, oh, can you hear me? Suddenly I had something coming up saying it was unstable. The parados where the chorus and some of the actors would enter, but most importantly the theatron, the place where people watched. And remember um, that the Greek- It was just cutting in and out. Oh, okay. How's it going now? Can you hear me? Can somebody say if they can hear me? And now you're frozen. Oh God, okay. Hang on, let me see what we can do. Any joy now? Somebody, can somebody tell me, can you hear me? Yeah, it's still yeah, a little okay. bit up. Listen guys, I'm sorry, our internet has been uh, you know, obviously so much traffic, but this is being recorded, so anything you miss you'll be able to listen back to, but you know, my apologies. I'm sure this is happening to everybody in every class. Zoom is crashing, the internet is going haywire. Um, so going back to the Theatron, the Greek word from which Theatron and theatre comes is Theo, I see, Theao my, I see for myself, which rebounds to you and back into myself so that the seeing is a circular oscillating process, like a lava lamp rather than like a line. Remember, we talked about that last week. So seeing is the crucial element in Greek theatre, seeing, perception, being. And of course, this ties massively in with the back eye. Do you remember when Pentheus says that he sees multiple suns? as in S-U-N-S. -S. When he's finally robed in the female dresses, in the, you know, in the women's dresses by Dionysus, he looks up and he sees multiple sons. In the same way that Agave, when she holds the head of her son, sees a lion. In other words, the seeing is something that is open to, oh, what should we say? Seeing is not being. Seeing is not understanding an empirical reality because there are multiple realities. So I asked in the last slide the question, whom do we see on stage? And I want to bring up this little fella. So this little fella is called William Finley, and he performed in Richard Schechner. Schechner's the bloke who wrote your set text for this course. Richard Schechner's completely groundbreaking production done in 1968 called Dionysus 69. You will have seen in last week's lecture, there was an image of a load of naked people writhing on the floor. So that was this production. Now Schechner with his theatre group wanted to explore what this story of the back eye was, but in a much more visceral level than with text. In other words, the text was done away with. What we had instead was bodies and affect, something that we felt, something that appealed not to our intelligence, but to the tingle factor inside us. So the production started off with this guy, William Finley, saying, my name is William Finley and I am the god Dionysus. For those of you who believe what I've just told you, that I'm a god, you are going to have a terrific evening. The rest of you are in for trouble. Now, think about that in relation to Dionysus and Pentheus. An actor walks on stage with a mask on and says, I am the god Dionysus. Do we see that actor or do we see the god Dionysus? 
remembering that we are in the teatron, where our seeing rebounds on ourselves. So, William Finley saying to a group of trendy New Yorkers in 1968 that I am the god Dionysus, but my name is also William Finley, in some way you could say absolutely represents the core of the back eye in terms of the constant mutability of reality and illusion. I want us to unpack this a little bit more. So, this is what we can say about the god Dionysus. He was the other. Think about the gods that we know of, the Olympian gods. You have Ares, the god of war, Aphrodite, the god of sex, Hera, the god of the hearth, Zeus, the head honcho, Apollo, the god of enlightenment, Artemis, the god of childbirth and virginity. Interesting contrast, that. And then the last of all the gods, Athena, obviously, goddess of Athens, of uh, some forms of warcraft and also of the intellect, etc., etc., the 12 deities of the Olympians go on with their rather specific roles and titles. But last kid on the block is Dionysus, the last god to be integrated into the Olympian pantheon. And Dionysus is interesting because he was born of a woman, well, sort of ish. He was the son of Semele, and of course you will have realized this from the Bacchae, that Semele's sisters are the ones who, don't, who are first and foremost to say that she was not raped by a god and that Dionysus is no god until of course he gets inside their minds. So Semele, poor thing, a mortal, shagged by Zeus. Hera, Zeus's sister and wife, didn't like this. Long and the short of it is, she ex was exploded by a bolt of lightning and Zeus took the baby, well, the, what should we say, fetus Dionysus and sewed him into his own thigh until Dionysus came to gestation and was born. That in itself, not a very auspicious start. Let's unpack too, though, what Dionysus is the god of. So he's the god of the theatre. And there we've already discussed the levels of representation. But he's also the god of wine, women, and song, and that itself is interesting. I don't know how many of you have ever been blind drunk. If you are, I would not recommend it. I certainly remember the first time I got completely plastered when I was at university. We'd just been completing a tour of Europe doing Macbeth, and we were coming back from Europe on the ferry to the UK. Uh, I think it was December the 23rd. Terrible, terrible weather. And we discovered in the back of the tour bus a crate of whiskey, which our producer had got to give to sponsors. And of course, we decided that wouldn't it be a good idea in this massive storm on the English Channel to drink it all. Um, and that's the first time I think I saw not just triplicate, but in fours, the world spinning and no sense of reality. Let's contrast that with what happens to Pentheus, of course. So Dionysus has the ability to turn our sense of reality upside down by the theatre and by alcohol. And these are very important elements because they go outside the norms of society. Our society, nice, clear, ordered. Well, not at the moment, because at the moment, of course, we have the other, the unknowable other, which is the coronavirus, which is the pandemic, which is something that the world has never, ever seen before in this way. Yes, there have been pandemics before, but the world has never closed down in this way. And this to us is the dangerous other, the thing which we cannot put our finger in, which we cannot empirically know. There's a term for the other, which is alterity. So that's all it means, otherness. It is the other. Alterity, then, is what is outside our norms. And to cross between what we know and what we don't know, our empirical understanding and the otherness that is outside, that is dangerous, to cross over that, we have to go over the limen. This is going back to the Latin for you, Samuel, was it? Um, the threshold. So let's talk for a minute about the concept of liminality. Now, you'll see that in your set text by Schechner, he actually talks about liminality. You don't need to worry about this. Well, at least I don't think you do for any exams. I just want you to think about what this does for you right now in terms of your understanding, not just of theatre and performance, but of the world right now. OK, liminality. So there is a threshold. 
For you guys right now, you're dealing with multiple frames of liminality. First of all, there's the liminality for those of you who have come from school to university. It's usually a rite of passage that happens in O week, which I don't think it's called that anymore, but it used to be called Green Week in Monash because that was the expected colour of your face after you'd been through all of the freshers' gigs. Crossing then from a state of childhood and adolescence into a state of adulthood, crossing from schooling into a state of university. Now, though, that's upended because that Lehman doesn't exist anymore. Your Lehman can be literally stepping from inside your house to outside your house. Suddenly the world has shrunk exponentially, except it's also expanded because of the use of the internet. So your threshold is wobbling all over the place and trying to work out what is integral to you, what is the safe place for you, and what is the other, the alterity out there, is something that you're going to have to negotiate, and we are all going to have to negotiate until this pandemic is over. Now, in anthropology, there is this expression, the rite of passage, the rite de passage. This was co coined in the 20th century by the anthropologist uh, Van Gennep and taken on by the performance theorist Victor Turner, who in turn influenced Richard Schechner. You don't need to worry about all of these figures. You'll come across them later if you stick with us. Right now, though, I just want to give you an overview. So in anthropology, a rite de passage, a rite of passage, is what happens when you go from one state to another. You cross over the limen. And as you are crossing over, you are in a state of liminality, and that means you can be the dangerous other. So let's think about how this correlates to the festival of Dionysus in Athens. Take yourself back 2,500 years ago. We're in Athens, 5th century BCE. Athens is at war with Sparta. There are multiple, multiple, um, uh, what should we call them, uh, alli alliances going on, but also betrayals going on between allies. Sparta's actually doing pretty well. Athens is not doing quite so well. Athens relies on its navy for its power and has built a wall all around itself, a wooden wall, to try to keep out the invaders. Now, remember that Athens was an, a, tie, a hugely um, militaristic society, not quite as militaristic as Sparta, but there was the expectation that every male citizen would take up arms, either as a hoplite, that's an infantryman, or as a, a cavalryman, or as um, somebody working on the ships, the triremes, the sailor. So, during the year, the year was full of battles, of course, but once a year, things would kind of stop. And this was for the festival of Dionysus, which lasted between three and four days. And during this period, three to four plays at changes at different stages in the fifth century, um, sorry, three to four, four playwrights would present three plays and a satire play, which was kind of like, as I said last week, a bit of a pantomime, a bit of a, a, a satirical skit. Through most of the 5th century, it was only three playwrights. And as we said last week, we only have the work of Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides left, even though we know that there were hundreds of uh, playwrights who competed. So let's think, first of all, about what was going on in this theatre. Well, first of all, we have the parade of the Golden Phallus through Athens. Now, we're a little bit, mm, what should we say, maybe a little bit coy about willies. But for Athens, the phallus, the erect penis, was an absolutely integral part of their understanding of the cosmos. So on virtually every crossroads, there would be a uh, plinth, um, sort of a, a stone statue, a stone block, with an erect phallus carved into it. And obviously this was a sign not just of uh, longing for, for fertility, but also a sign of masculine power of the patriarchy, something which in itself is interesting because the goddess, the patron goddess of Athens, Athena, is, was always the unshakable virgin, somebody who would never have relations with a man, but yet was totally pro the male. 
So you'd have all of these phalluses everywhere. And the citizen body would walk through in procession, in solemn pr procession through Athens with this enormous golden phallus, erect phallus. And people at this stage were trying to honor the gods, so they were drinking. They were getting a little bit plastered and it's only nine o'clock in the morning. They arrive in the theater of Dionysus. And then we start to have the rituals. So what we have is the citizen body around the Theatron and down at the very beginning we have the rulers of Athens. Now these were people who were democratically elected. They were called the generals, the strategoi. And we also have the priests who were giving a uh, ritual sacrifice and we have the ambassadors of some of the states who were vassals to Athens. In other words, they were there to support the, what was known as the Delian League, the Athens and their allies who were trying to beat up the Spartans. At the beginning of the theatrical day, the theater of Dionysus, there would be prayers, there would be sacrifices, there would be an announcement of all the money that had come into the Delian League from the Allies, which if you can imagine was a bit of a kick in the teeth to the Allies who were sitting there thinking, we've given all our dosh to Athens and what have we got in return for it. There was also an extraordinary um, ritual whereby the sons, the teenage sons of soldiers who had died the previous year in the war, were given armor the armor of their fathers. Now, sometimes this was real, sometimes this was, uh, um, if you like, not fake armor, but armor that had been created for the state to present. Now, that's a really interesting thing. In that circle of the orchestra, we have men who are not yet men, they are boys, but they're not yet boys because they are liminal. The presentation of the armor turns them from boys into men. So the frame of the Theatre of Dionysus, of this festival, is so far all about liminality. The entrance from outside, from the city, to inside the Theatre of Dionysus. The transition of the boys to the men. The sanctification of the proceedings through sacrifice. In terms of the theories of liminality, this is what we call the pre-liminal state, basically where everybody's preparing themselves for the rite of passage. Then we have the liminality of what is going on on stage. So let's think, for instance, about the back eye. Could there be a more liminal play? Because there we are dealing not just with the god Dionysus, but also with everything that we think we know and everything that we know we don't know about perception and reality, an alternative universe. And you could say that all of the tragedies that we have present an alternative universe, a place where in the seemingly secure patriarchy of Athens, where women were treated, um, Look, I mean, there's lots of there's lots of controversy about the position of women in Athens, but it ranges between people for saying that they are were treated like women under the Taliban to like women under Saudi Arabian law. Probably Saudi Arabia is closest, but you know, not many rights, shall we say? Yet in the theatre, in that liminal space, we have Medea killing her children and Clytemnestra killing her husband, and Antigone defying the rules of the state, and Electra going against what we will discuss when we come to Antigone, had been uh, rules put in place to stop women mourning. In this liminal stage of the theatre, all of our taboos can be explored. So you go through this liminal period, you see these extraordinary plays which are reflecting alternative reality, and you leave the theatre feeling better. Yeah, I feel great now. I've seen a bit of bloodshed. I've seen a bit of incest, a bit of cannibalism. I'm feeling fine. And so you become reintegrated back into Athenian society in the post-liminal period, feeling better about your own identity because you have gone through a cathartic purgation. Now, cathartic is something that comes from Aristotle. Aristotle was a philosopher in the fourth century. So remember, that is the century after the Greek tragedies who wrote in his text, The Poetics, about what we need to create a, a powerful and effective tragedy. And that is opsis. Opsis means what we see. And that is reversal of fortune, which we absolutely see with Pentheus and Dionysus. And that is recognition, 
which we see turned on its head in the back eye because how do we know what recognition is? Do we recognize Dionysus? Does Pentheus recognize the god? Does Pentheus recognize his mother? And sure as heck, Agave doesn't recognize Pentheus until right at the end. And we have catharsis. So, so uh, oh yeah, sorry, peripatia, um, change in, in fortune. So, opsis, vision, the spectacle, peripatia, the change in fortune, and agnoresis, recognition, catharsis, the purgation of the soul. So the idea that you can watch something which is deeply tragic, you can bawl your eyes out, and at the end of that, you feel purged. You feel like a better person who can go back into society in the post-liminal period, knowing where you fit in society. Well, the reincorporation into society is something that for us now, when we deal with tragedy and when we deal with theatre generally, something for us is much harder to define. So you could say that you watch Billy Elliot or you go and see Harry Potter and the Cursed Child or you go and see an avant-garde piece of performance art at La Mama and that theatre event does something to you so that as you come out of the theatre you are feeling like a different person. The big question is though, does that reincorporate you into society as a political entity? So, let's go back to Aristotle and think about this. This comes from his politics, don't need to worry about this, but the theory behind it is something that's pretty crucial from all this. Aristotle says that by nature, and that's an important thing, by nature, man, and I make no apologies for not saying man slash woman or non-gender binary because we're dealing with Aristotle here who dealt in an entirely patriarchal world. You should see what he says about women's issues and hysteria. So man is by nature a political animal. In other words, we have that interesting correlation, nature, animal. And man, the word used is anthropos as opposed to aner. Aner is a bloke who's you know, your serious, bogan, uh, wife beater, um, beer drinking uh, Aussie, whereas anthropos is man as in mankind, the generic term. By nature, what does that mean, by nature? And a political animal. So man is also an animal. Importantly, though, he says, the man who is not part of the polis, the city-state, is either greater than or lesser than man. That's really interesting when it comes to Greek tragic heroes, and really interesting when it comes to the Bacchae. So, I want us to have a think about the amazing Charles Siegel. He's a, he's a wonderful, wonderful classicist, um, probably my favourite classicist. And he says this, under the protection of the god, the dramatic performance could express all that the disciplined life of the polis suppressed. Release of emotion, potential chaos, loss of rational control, power of the female component. All of those things which are the other. Let's go back to otherness and alterity. Things that are other to us. So in other words, the god allows chaos and allows a celebration of chaos. And we can actually get a view of that from this. This is um, from Adina Jacobs' production of Bacchae, which was done, I think, three, four years ago. Um, and you'll see that I've included on that video, which I uploaded, uh, the trailer to this. This was a fascinating production. And uh, I was asked to host the feedback session on this production. So this production was done with young women from St. Martin's um, Theatre School. And they were about, they ranged between 14 and 16. It was an extraordinary life-changing event for these young women because the sheer chaos, the anarchy of the world that they were entering by doing this radical avant-garde adaptation of the Bacchae allowed them to understand all sorts of things about their identity, about their sexuality, about their gender identity, and it was no, it was kind of interesting that by the end of the production, um, some of the, the young women found it possible to say that they were lesbians, that they were non-binary. Um, it allowed a real openness into the, the deconstruction of what society says a young woman should be. Now, in the talkback, I found this amazing. 
So the young women from the cast who had joined the talkback were full of praise for this experience that they'd been on, uh, they'd been part of. But I remember a middle-aged woman, maybe a little older than me, but not much older, who laid into the production saying that it was pornographic, that it was taking advantage of young women's bodies, that it was obscene, that it was close to the work of Bill Henson. Um, Bill Henson is a very controversial photographer who uh, has had similar, well, he's actually had his shows closed down on accusations of child pornography. Check him out online, Bill Henson. So this image, look at this image, a sexualized image. We have nubile young bodies, female bodies in bikinis with their torsos and their musculature heightened through oil and their faces covered. Is that a pornographic, sexually provocative image or is it something that actually is terrifying? For the woman who asked that question, it was both because she did not want to think that anarchy and chaos could exist within the social boundaries that we have put on the behavior of young women. So it's okay for young women to do sexually explicit selfies, but this is not okay, an image that is so disturbing and discombobulating. So what we have in Siegel's quotation here is this wonderfully um, uh, lucid, analysis of what Dionysus does and what theatre does. He goes on to talk about the tragic hero, saying that he occupies this point between life and death. There is a transition, there are opposing statuses, man-beast, man-god. So let's relate this then to what Aristotle said, man is by nature a political animal and the man who is not part of the polis is either greater than or lesser than man. So as you read Greek tragedies, you'll see again and again that the hero is somebody who transgresses the boundaries of society, goes over the lemen, and if you like, spends his, or as we'll discuss next week, her entire identity and, and uh, existence straddling, moving between the here and the other, constantly in a realm of the liminal. Now, there we have the image of the naked bodies from Dionysus 69. And Siegel carries on to say that Dionysus provides the liminal space, the space between truth and delusion, sanity, madness, divinity, bestiality, civilization, and the wild order and chaos, the paradoxes of tragedy. So that's why I wanted to start in terms of looking at the texts that we have of Greek tragedy with the last one, with the Bacchae. Because understanding the Bacchae can enable us to look through all of Greek tragedy and see quite how the liminality of the characters correlates to the liminality of the theatrical event, which correlates to the liminality of the staging in the Festival of Dionysus, which correlates to the attempt to order the polis, order the world around us. So we have a nub of chaos which enables us to try to make sense of what we hope is the structured, unchaotic, rule-bound society in which we live. This, of course, is particularly relevant for us now, because what are the rules of our society? I don't know if you've been listening to ScoMo recently, but, you know, I'm a clever woman. I read the news, I listen to it, I read the newspapers. I have I'm in a state of total perplexity as to what we can do and what we can't. How can we have meetings restricted to two people, but yet 10 people at a funeral and hairdressers cutting hair as long as they can stand 1.5 meters away? It's, a, I don't know, I don't know how we can possibly structure this society. One reason why perhaps we should turn to Dionysus and the mimetic world, the world of representation to help us understand all this. So, as Siegel continues, bringing Dionysus on stage in the back eye enables us to try to understand the difference between empirical truth as we see it and perceived truth as we feel it. Mind body split, perhaps, which is what we see in Pentheus. Because if we go back to what Siegel said about the uh, liminality of the tragic hero, Let's look at Pentheus and Dionysus and try to work out who is the tragic hero in this. 
We all look at Pentheus and we think, oh no, he's a bit of a bit of a dill, really, isn't he? But actually, is he? Because here is a man who is trying to bring order to chaos. A man who is trying to control these crazy women who are off in the mountains. You could think of the correlation of um, a right-wing politician who is trying to control hippies or snowflakes or rabid feminists or anybody who does not want to conform to a conservative status quo. But if you live in a time of panic, of paradox, of otherness, of shifting rules and mores, then a conservative control can actually be quite comforting. And this is the strong part of me that just wishes we go into complete lockdown. Stage three, stage four, have a ruler who is actually really, really stern and says, this is what we have to do because this is the way we have to get through things. I actually don't mind having my civic rights curtailed at the moment. And that's quite big for me because, you know, I'm a kind of wishy-washy, laid-back socialist sort of girl and I don't really like conservative rules. But right now I do because we're in a state of chaos. So, is this Pentheus? A man who is actually flawed, but is actually trying to be a good ruler. And then along comes Dionysus, and all hell breaks loose. The big question is, who is the liminal hero here? Dionysus, who in his very being is the god of chaos. We know that we cannot try to pin down Dionysus because he is completely liminal. Or Pentheus, who is going from one state, which is being conservative, rigorous, ruthless, ordered, but transitions through that liminality into a state of otherness and alterity, which is to be under the spell of the god Dionysus, to see multiple suns, to move from that cave where everything was seemingly so ordered, but yet was not the reality, to see a new reality. And is that a reality at all? So Pentheus and Dionysus, if you like, they vie for who has the tragic status in this play. It's not so much about the nomenclature, who we say is the hero, it's actually about the journey that they go on. I want to finish off by looking at this. Do we have anybody who is up for telling me what this image is? Come on, you know you want to. Uh, isn't that the image that says this is not a pipe? It is the image that says this is not a pipe. Would somebody like yeah. to elaborate on that? Um, it is. It's a photo of a pipe rather than a visualization. I've been listening. Yeah. Okay. So it's um it's by Magritte. Um, and it was famous in terms of the uh, uh, one of the key elements of the sur surrealist movement. This is not a pipe. Okay, well, look, clearly it is a pipe, but it's not a pipe because it's a representation of a pipe, etc., etc., etc. You get the point. But what happens then when we look at Dionysus on stage? So here's the thing, and here's the great paradox, which I love of the Bacchae. The reason that Pentheus is torn to pieces is not just because he doubts Dionysus, but it's about his wireism, his scopophilia. Scopophilia means um, sort of a, a sexual predilection for watching. And there is something sexual in his watching, just as there's something sexual in his transvestism. Pentheus is torn apart for watching. And the verb using is te aomai, in his case te oetai, which means he watches. He watches for himself in that oscillating rebound. But we're in the theatre. And in the theatre we have to watch because the theatre is called the watching place. So here we are watching a man being, well, we're hearing about a man who is torn to pieces for watching. And then his mother is brought on and we watch the head we watch the eyes of the mask, which have done the watching. Torn apart, that body completely rent in two because watching was the last thing that he should do. We realize as we watch him, as we watch that head, as we watch Dionysus, an utter conundrum. So I wanna finish with this image. This is in a buzz, William Finley. 
So what do we think when we look at this image then in relation to Dionysus 69? And if anybody's interested, you can just Google that, Dionysus 69. And on YouTube, you'll see a very strange film done by Brian Palmer before he got into his violent stage, which is a split screen, very poor quality recording of Dionysus 69, where you see the sheer mayhem and chaos that this production was. William Finley started the production by saying, I am William Finley and I am the god Dionysus. And if you believe me, you're going to have a great time. And if you don't believe me, you're in trouble. So looking at William Finley and saying, yes, this is William Finley, but he's not, he's Dionysus, but he's not, he's William Finley, but he's not, he's just an actor who's playing William Finley. Or is William Finley playing an actor? Or what? That very sentence encapsulates all that is problematic and wonderfully bonkers about Greek theatre, about theatre generally, about our assumptions of what is real and what is not, what is mimetic and what exists in the world of reality and empirical observation, which in itself might be just as complicated as what happens in our nocturnal dreams. So next week we're going to be talking about Antigone, which will be much less philosophical. Um, and uh, if today has sort of made your brain itchy, good, that's how it should be. But next week will be way more um, laid back, I think. Before we go, can I ask questions, comments? Does anybody want to join in and have a chat about this? Are you all stunned? Okay, folks. Well, remember, if you do, just drop me an email, okay, and then I will sort out a Zoom meeting between us. Um, similarly, if a group of you from Tutes want to have a chat, we can, we can make a kind of group meeting about this. And the other really, really important thing is to remember that I'm here for you. I'm the first year coordinator. So if anything's bothering you, just please get in touch. I will post this recording up on uh, the week 2B3 um, Moodle page as soon as I have enough internet space to do so, which will be sometime this afternoon. Meanwhile, I hope you enjoy your tutes and please stay well and safe. Okay, guys, bye. Oh, oh Jane, hello. I think there's a question. Oh, um, hi. Hello. Hi, uh, Melanie has just asked, will there be a recommended translation of Antigone posted to Moodle? Ah, not recommended. What there will be is a, uh, okay, so the thing about translations is they are all interpretations done by other people, like we discussed last week with the Greek tragedies too. So there is no translation that I would recommend, but there are lots that are interesting to compare and contrast. So I will put several up. I'm also going to put up, um, a translation adaptation that I did for Malthouse Theatre uh, a couple of years ago because there's a controversy surrounding that which is to do with gender and we're going to be discussing gender. So all of this will go up online uh, hopefully by tomorrow. Yeah, by tomorrow, definitely. Um, I do not want you to feel that you need to read every translation. Yeah, I want you to read the whole play, but you are absolutely at liberty to read a third of one translation, a third of the other, a third of the other. And with my adaptation, you can either read it or I'm actually going to post the whole production online, um, which is about, uh, what was it, uh, 70 minutes. Yeah, so it was an hour and 10 production. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, any other questions? I'm just bringing up, oh, look, we've got, we've got chat here. Uh, recommend translation. Yeah, the Penguin translation isn't bad. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, the thing about translations is most of them, as we said last week, they're written by classicists. They're not written by theatre people. So if you try to act these translations, many of them can be really hard. Whereas, um, look, that's okay, actually. The very fact that some of them are hard to act is, is okay. It all adds to what we're discussing about. Any I, questions? I might add to that as well, Jane, that translation is going to be a big topic of conversation, not only in the lecture next week, but also in the tutorial, we're going to play with a bunch of different translations right. and all we'll have experiments with different ones and get you comparing and contrasting what the different translations do. So going out and reading a bit of a bunch of translations will be a, a great preparatory task for next week. Terrific. Thanks. Um, okay, guys, anything else for me? 
All right. Well, uh, see you. Maya says, sorry, Maya says, is the week three quiz going to be on Moodle? Yes, it should already be open. I wouldn't tackle it until you've read the back eye, though. Terrific. Thank you, everyone, for your attention and for your comments. Uh, I wish we could meet in person, but, you know, this is going OK. Um, and I will see you next Monday. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Hey.